Week three, conscious marketing. Now, one of the things we talked about in week one and is a recurring motif through the subject is the idea that there is more to marketing than just growth strategies. What we'd like to introduce you to here is the idea that there's more to marketing than just the profit motive. Marketing is a toolkit. It is a business practice. It originated as business practice. But it's an adaptable and adaptive platform that can be taken into other contexts and other environments. Here at the ANU, we have specialist research in political marketing. Dr. Andrew Hughes and myself are both political marketers. We have societal influence marketing. We have social marketing, for which there is a full subject. We have sustainable marketing, which Dr. Gary Buttress deals with on a regular basis. And we have some degree of connection, obviously, by our proximity to federal parliament to government-based marketing. All of these frameworks, all of these ideas are basically about taking the philosophy, strategy, and tactics of marketing and using them for a non-profit or alternative to profit motive. This particular chapter, this talks about conscious marketing, and I'm also going to talk about some of the other aspects, some particularly social marketing and political marketing. So what we first need to understand is that there is conscious marketing, which is intentional and deliberate actions, where you're thinking about what is the primary consequence of my marketing. This is where the ethics comes in on a regular basis in marketing is we've talked about segmentation, targeting, and positioning. But when you consciously segment a market, you are doing so to deliberately and intentionally exclude others. When you are targeting, you are targeting a message to a particular group of people to the exclusion of others. This brings with it ethical considerations, ethical concerns. And that is why, as conscious marketing, you have to be deliberate in your choices. You have to think, what am I doing? What am I intending as my consequence? What is that consequence in terms of my target market, but also society at large. Now there's conscientious marketing, which is marketing which does good by design and default. Conscious marketing doesn't have to do good. In fact, there's no mandate across the board with a neutral toolkit that you have to do good. The majority of people using a particular toolkit or using a particular technique will regard themselves as being on the side of light and justice and goodness and everything else, but you don't have to be. You can go, wake up in the morning and say, you know what, today's the day we're gonna do evil and we're gonna find, we're gonna offer value offers for bad people to do bad things and we're gonna do it for money. It's a legit strategy, but it's not necessarily one that's sustainable because those Evil tends not to be self-sustaining, tends to be uh, at least a bonus feature. But also the idea of the conscious marketing is intentional and deliberate. You know what you're doing and you're doing it by choice and you're choosing that outcome. Conscientious, you're doing to do good. So the four principles of the conscious marketing, a greater purpose than just profit. There is a consideration of stakeholders you are thinking about this, this is a whole of organization, uh, particularly from the top throughout the firm rather than just frontline staff or two or three people in a PR department somewhere. And this idea of conscious culture or what I'd refer to as ethically sourced decisions. Are your decisions ethically sourced, sustainable, renewable and recyclable? So the idea of the higher purpose. First thing I'm going to say is there's been some absolute disasters on this front where organizations have gone out to have a higher purpose. Uh, Google had don't be evil as a statement in their strategic plans. That got removed recently, so Google has be evil as a, an option. 
So if you're thinking about higher purpose here, functionally it's a higher purpose than just make more money. If your organization's first goal is to make the world a different place, be it for better or for worse, for good or for evil, then you are in the category of a higher purpose. And it's key to remember that the neutrality of a toolkit means that what you choose to do with that toolkit provides whether it's good or evil. So you can't step back and go, oh, it was just marketing and attribute good or bad to the marketing. It's your action and your intent that makes the difference here. So you step one for conscious marketing, higher purpose, more, you're in it for more than just the money. Second element that you're dealing with here is that you've got the idea of thinking about stakeholders. Now we've mentioned stakeholders a couple of times in previous chapters and previous weeks. A stakeholder is any member of the social or economic system who will be impacted by the decisions made during the marketing process and who will have some degree of say either over that impact or over the implementation and outcomes of the marketing activity. Now, stakeholders are an important facet and we need to understand that they exert influence, they can be direct influences. For example, the customers and clients are the most direct influence, not just in terms of buying product, but in terms of feedback from satisfaction, in terms of direction. If you say that you want to make the world a better place and your customers are going, hey, you're not doing that, they're acting as your stakeholders. But you also have your partners in the supply lines, you have your retailers, you have people either side of you. So stakeholders become important members of the decision-making process who exert influence. You also have indirect stakeholders. You have the environment itself, but non-customers, society, and particularly media. Media is a very strong stakeholder because a positive or negative portrayal of your actions in the media can have a huge influence. So the media can exert a lot of power. Certain media channels may not exert as much legitimacy in their complaints, particularly if they are, how should we say, misrepresenting the degree to which they represent broader public opinion, but they may have urgency. Uh, particularly if you've got a camera crew hammering your door down, asking you awkward questions, they're doing it because they want ratings, but also that they feel that they can exert urgency and power over you through close proximity of a video camera and a telejournalist. The third element to the conscious marketing is it's more than a slogan. Look, if you want to do slogans, that's spin doctoring, that's a completely different thing. If you want it to be a meaningless slogan that you mouth and it has no value whatsoever, there are plenty of other places to do this. In conscious marketing, the idea that you're making the world a different place has to be holistic. It has to be a whole of organization commitment. Your key functional element here is that whatever that conscious decision, whatever that intention is, whatever it is that's the overall strategic goal of the organization, you want that to be a driving force that influences all of the decisions, resides within the strategy, and sits in the overall framework of the organization. So if your holistic view, if your greater than profit view is make the world happier, you're going to need to look at the whole of the chain. You're going to need to look at how, let's make the world a happy place. Let's be the happiest place in Australia. You're going to have to make certain that you actually paid the wages that your staff are, are owed. And you're going to have to engage in a lot of corporate reviews to ensure you know, workplace satisfaction, employee satisfaction, supply lines, chains. It has to be more than a slogan. If it's a slogan, whoop-de-doo. 
No one's going to care. Now, the ethical sourcing of decisions. This is a, an important and critical element here is ethical conduct needs to be rewarding. Your decisions have to be ethically sourced. If you're going to have a greater purpose, your purpose must be met. But there are quite often market values here where it's easier to run unethically in the short term because it gives you a brief shining competitive advantage for long enough to sell off your firm to someone else. Ethics are also a challenge because they are a subjective element. There are various religious views, there are societally enforced views, there are societally informed views. Ethics is bigger than marketing and we do sell ethics as a couple of separate add-on packs and DLC components in sustainability, in strategy, and throughout most of the other subjects people will raise the ethics as they come up. But if you're going to do more than profit motive and you intend to do good, then you have to do good. You actually have to go out and put the commitment to conduct yourself ethically. Solve problems, identify and accept failures, and fix things. Now we did mention that uh, because you can do this for more than just the profit motive, that there's an important there's an important aspect of marketing that we need to consider. We run a full semester length subject on sustainability and sustainable marketing because that is now an organizational function. Marketing can be sustainable. Marketing does not need to be growth oriented and destructive. And particularly one of the things with the marketing processes is that the marketing message needs to be sustainable and the marketing activities need to be sustainable. Sustainability also has a question here in terms of you know, how we define it, but for our purposes we're going to look at it as both organizational longevity and improved conditions for the world around us. There's no point having a marketing campaign if you don't have an audience and there's no point having a sustainable campaign if you can't keep it up. If you can be beaten out of your marketplace by an unsustainable competitor, then your challenge is going to be, whilst you're trying to make the world a better place, your competitive rival is making the world a worse place. So you've got to beat them in the market in order to improve conditions overall, to meet your top level goal. Societal marketing, this is an older technique, uh, again comes out of the mid-90s, early 94. It's the idea that you put the marketing decisions of companies' interest and customers' interests are one of three possible interests to serve, society's long-term interest being the priority. You create a firm, you create an organization with a view to let's make the world a better place. Now for this it can be things like cooperatives and collectives, it can be uh, employee owned organizations where the game plan is create employment. Create employment that will be sustained and sustainable as priority one for a social goal, increasing employment in a region, and then phases two and three are meet the needs of customers so that the company can stay afloat. But the idea here is that you want to be thinking about stakeholders, society at large, as a key part of your marketing activity. Social marketing is the marketing of social change. We have a specialist course here at the ANU that's uh, again like sustainable we run a full dedicated semester length course in social marketing. The two things to remember with social marketing, thing number one is that social marketing is the marketing of social change, not just social media. And two is that marketing is a toolkit. Social marketing is an ethically neutral toolkit, marketing is a neutral toolkit. 
marketing segmentation activities tend to bias it towards certain problems. However, marketing is guided by the ability to change, benef change communities and individuals for a greater social benefit. And the idea with social marketing is that we take the same techniques we use to understand the audience, to tailor messages, products, distribution strategies, and pricing strategies to that audience, and use those skills and abilities to create social good. We do a lot of this around health-based marketing. So if you can use the same skill set that gets us to get an iPhone in every back pocket or an Android in the front pocket, and use it for vaccinations or health checkups, blood testing, blood donation, organ donation, all of these facets of improving overall health of a society, these are some of the factors we look at. And we explore this in social marketing. So this is for more than a profit motive. This is doing marketing beyond just making the money. This one is do marketing to make a better society. Political marketing, as I mentioned before, Dr. Hughes and I are political marketing researchers. Our view is that marketing has a role to play in the understanding of politics. And the problem we have at the moment is we're not using the whole of marketing. We've got people just cherry picking communications. Empty promises, spin, PR, slogans, three-word three slogans. That's a failure of the market and that's a failure of, to use the whole of marketing. We talk about marketing, political marketing, as the creation of the offering, the promises of value. If there's no promise of value, there's no political marketing. If you're not putting forward a policy, a politician, or a worldview, then you're not using political marketing. There has to be a core product, there has to be something in there. Without that, it's fluff, spin, PR, call it what you want. It's not marketing if there's no product. And finally, I want to bring you back to stakeholders for a, a moment here because stakeholders are a conceptual area that they're going to influence a lot of the decisions you'll make in marketing. So there's a couple of things around stakeholders. There's the stakeholder mapping exercise and there's the three types of influences. I've mentioned the three influences in the, the video so far, so we're gonna pick them up in a little bit of detail. A stakeholder basically is one of three types. You've either got the stakeholders who are within the organization, and those are your employees, but also your managers, or you've got the stakeholders who are connected to, but outside of the firm, we've got the list there. And then you've got the external stakeholders, people who are within the social system that you are operating in, within your markets, within your society, within your community, but who are not directly part of your firm. They're not connected to you straight up. Understanding the influences, an employee's influence, if the employee says no, if the manager says yes and the employee says no, then you've got stakeholder tension. You're connected to elements. Can your supply line, you want to be an ethically, uh, an ethical product uh, provided in a sustainable way? Can your suppliers meet that need whilst meeting the demand? One of the biggest challenges that we faced is that ethical scale up. There are unethical ways to scale up and rapid growth, fast growth and high demand often entice people to go to unethical solutions when the reason there's demand for their product in the first place was their ethical conduct. And the external stakeholders, who can leverage influence over your decisions and your organization and who will be impacted by the decisions of your organization? That's the other thing to consider is that when we talk about stakeholders in terms of influence in, we also have the influence out. When an organization, you're working for a firm, the firm engages in some obvious and overt misconduct. You work for an Australian chef who's appeared on TV, 
who's underplay, underpaid everyone, and you're a manager in that organization, you're going to be wearing some of the reputation damage that's come to and through their misconduct. But also, because the uh, employees were underpaid, people haven't wanted to engage, haven't wanted to shop at that organization, haven't wanted to buy from that restaurant chain or the restaurant brands, they're being impacted. So the manager's decision to not pay the wages fairly has harmed the brand of the in the marketplace. That's going to hurt the distributor. That's going to hurt the suppliers who have, so a restaurant chain goes broke, it takes, it may take out the supply lines behind it, the people who are providing the fresh fruit and vegetables and the fresh meat. So the suppliers take a hit, the finances take a hit, the employees take a hit. The decisions that take place impact and ripple beyond just the immediate decision. It's not quite chaos theory, but stakeholder mapping has a little bit of that question of, if we do X, what are the consequences of X? Which is why it comes up in the conscious marketing. We want those consequences to be intentional. Now, a key element I've mentioned a couple of times through here is the idea of the three attributes of a stakeholder. A stakeholder can be powerful. A stakeholder can have high levels of legitimacy or um, low le levels as well, and urgency. When a stakeholder brings their interests to the organization, how quickly do you need to deal with it? So from the power side is, can the stakeholder exert their will over you? Legitimacy is, do they have a claim that is grounded in law or morality? And urgency is, how soon do you want them to stop being a stakeholder of influence? How quickly do you need to address them? It is possible to have, as you can see from the, the circle diagram, the overlaps, a dangerous stakeholder is someone who has a lot of power, a lot of urgency, and no legitimacy. This is the person who comes in and shouts and screams about not getting a refund on their product and they're going to bring lawyers and sue and they go full Karen and ask for the manager and then you find out that they didn't actually buy the product from the store in the first place they just came in to know that loudness and urgency means they had power the legitimacy was non-existent similarly you can have people with a very legitimate claim an urgent legitimate claim, but no clout, no power, no ability to exert their will, so they uh, become dependent on other stakeholders to influence for them. We're raising these ideas because as you move into your latter part of this semester, you start thinking about aspects around segmentation, targeting, positioning, and you start thinking about decisions around the marketing mix, Having the idea of stakeholder impact in the back of the mind, having the idea of we're going to conscious marketing, deliberate intentional acts of marketing activity for intended outcomes. Having these in the back of the mind is going to be useful because you can start thinking, well, what does happen if I set a price or I decide I'm not going to distribute my product at this location compared to another location? Or who will be impacted by my distribution decisions. It's about being that more corporate mindfulness, about that greater level of corporate awareness, and also that consciousness. These are my choices. I will accept my consequences from my choices, good and bad, because I have made intentional decisions. So to recap, conscious marketing, it's doing things intentionally. It's doing it for more than just the money and it's doing it for, with an eye to the whole of the organization is involved, the decisions flow from the top to the bottom and back again, and the impact of those decisions is accepted, and it's part of the willful, deliberate nature of marketing that we do make our choices intentionally to have outcomes we intend, 
and we accept the consequences of those outcomes.